thank you very much for coming, everyone. Hopefully you're here for this talk. I titled it, Neotron and why write a brand new DOS for ARM in Rust? Just trying to squeeze all of the keywords into the title. But really, you can. we're going to spend the next hour taking a, taking a romp, taking a hike, taking a gallop through computing history. We're going to ask ourselves, what is a computer? What is an operating system? And then at the end, I'll talk about why I wrote a new one. So a little bit about me to start. Um, so my name is Jonathan Pallant. Uh, I'm an embedded systems engineer, have been for 25 years at this point. Um, done a lot of programming languages in the past. Started with BASIC, Turbo Pascal, did some Modular 2. Um, I may have written some Tickle once upon a time. I don't put that on the slide. Um, mainly these days, I'm a Rust programmer and Rust trainer, and I work at Ferris Systems based out of Berlin. We do training courses and we do Rust-based consultancy. Um, all of my stuff is mainly on GitHub, where you will find me slash the JPster. You'll find me talking a lot on Twitter about this and other nonsense projects involving old computers. Uh, I came to Twitter late, so I could only get slash the real JPster. There is a the, the JPster on Twitter, that's not me. Um, and this project exists at its own little GitHub pages. Um, and there you will even find these slides. These slides are written in Markdown. You are free to fork them. Um, share them, um, whatever you want. So if you want to find any little references, you can look at the GitHub and you can get the material. OK, so what I want to do today is to introduce this sort of operating system I'm writing and talking about why I wanted to write it. But to do that, I need to set the scene and talk about the other operating systems that already exist, because why not use one of those is a perfectly valid question slash criticism. But to do that, I think it's useful to talk about the history of the operating system. And to do that, we really need to cover off first and foremost, what is an operating system? What do we mean when we use that term? Um, I'd like this to be an interactive talk. Confession, I did originally present this at ACCU where I had 90 minutes, which is why this has been moved up from a uh, a hike through to a gallop through computing history, because there's a lot of computing history to cover. But I'd like this to be interactive. So um, in the spirit of, uh, of uh, the Boeing keynote we had yesterday, um, every time I mention a computer company that is sadly no longer with us, whether having been acquired or folded through crass mismanagement, um, just punch your fists in the air and we'll say, Skull. OK, it's just in memory of, of computer companies that have sadly departed. Now, there will be, there'll be some familiar names in here for, for some of you. OK, but let's talk about what an operating system is. Let's even define the term OS, operating system. Not to be confused with DOS, a disk operating system, often pronounced DOS. Now, there was a very famous DOS written by Microsoft when I say DOS, I don't necessarily mean that one. I mean sort of operating systems that work with disks in a more wider sense. If I mean the Microsoft DOS, I'll say so. Um, there is also the real-time operating system. We're not really talking about those at all. Those belong to the set of embedded systems. And this talk is not about embedded systems. I mean, the, the PC, I've, PCB I've got looks like an embedded system, but it's not. I've tried to make it a general purpose computer, and I think that's a different thing. So what does an operating system or a disk operating system need to do? Well, I think it needs to do four things. It needs to run applications, run on a computer, manage some files, probably on disk, hence the name, and give you some kind of portability. So I think we will agree that is an application. That is, anyone recognize that one? You've all used it. Yeah, it's Microsoft Word for Mac OS. It's got things we recognize for applications. There's some like a window with some, some controls on it. There's a menu system. There's a status bar at the bottom. That is an application. Is this an application? I'd say it is, yeah. It's processing user input. It's providing some output. It's still got a menu and a status bar. This is Microsoft Word 5 for DOS. The key thing I want to get across here is don't think about applications purely through the lens of how you currently interact with them. They're a concept that exists 
beyond that it extends into the past we have had programs and applications for a long time and they didn't look like the ones you use now it's an app on your iphone this is arguably an app as is this this is microsoft word version one for ms dos um, resolution is slightly lower we still have a sort of a status bar at the bottom um, we definitely don't sort of have any menu system and you're going to be uh, i think exclusively uh, pretty much exclusively using the keyboard, although there is a sort of pretty low-res mouse cursor on there. Is this an application? So this is the game Wordle that someone is running on an ASR33 teletype. So there is some kind of mini computer system in the in the background. Perhaps we don't know what's connected to the teletype, but it's connected over some serial link, and you're in Visual Studio Code, right? Brand new text editor on your brand new Macintosh. And you select the option to say, open terminal. Ever wondered why it's called a terminal? Or it's sometimes known as a, a teletype. This is a teletype. It is a teletypewriter. It types things according to stuff that comes in over a cable from long away. Why is this a terminal? Because as with a railway line, the terminal is at the end of the line. So there is a mini computer somewhere with multiple serial cables coming out, and the terminal sits at the end of each line. This machine receives bytes, probably an ASCII, and it prints them, and anything you type on the keyboard goes back down the line. That is exactly how your terminal in Visual Studio Code works. These concepts are not new. They exist from the old times. OK, so we have some sense of what an application is. We get some sense that we shouldn't be constrained by its specific visual form. But there is some sense of input, some output, and some storage. So a disk operating system runs on a computer. What is a computer? Well, a computer has a processing unit, a CPU that executes some instructions. We tell it what to do, and it does it. It doesn't judge us for this. It just does what it's told to do. And we have this idea of registers, these little places where we can store data temporarily. But that's not enough. We need some memory. We need more storage. Memory is, I like to think of it as the locker room at your local swimming pool. There are a, num a series of numbered boxes. You can open locker number 25 and you can put shoes in it. You can lock it. It's in there. Later, you can look in locker number 25 and it will still contain shoes. That's basically what RAM is. It's just a place where we can store numbers. Um, we have this idea of volatile and non-volatile memory. Um, I would argue all memory is volatile. It is simply a matter of time scale. Um, if you have a computer from the early 1980s, you may find it's not working anymore because the ROM chips have died. Those ROM chips were technically non-volatile when they were during the warranty period. But as time goes on, these things fail. Hard disks. How many of you have pulled a hard disk out of the cupboard after 20 years and gone, oh, I wonder if that backup still works? Maybe not. But then we need some input and output, right? So we can, if we had this beautiful black obsidian monolith with a power input, no LEDs, no buttons, it just hummed. We could say the computer is running, it's doing good work. What work is it doing? I don't know. Don't know. It doesn't have any input or output. Therefore, we assume it is correct, right? That, that is not a useful computer. That is a space heater. A computer must have input and output. We must be able to give it um, commands. And this is usually display, keyboard, storage devices, communication. You know, we're all familiar with this. Um, computers often pretend that their input and output is actually just memory. There's just special regions of memory, you know, a locker where you put the shoes in and it's not really a locker because there's someone on the other side who opens the other door and looks in and goes, shoes, great, I'll swap those, and you can have you know, a bag of sweets in return. Next time you look in the locker, a bag of sweets has appeared. This is bizarre. This, this locker is not functioning like a locker. Some memory does not function like memory. It is actually input and output. Uh, I think we'd agree this is a computer. IBM System 360. We're looking 1965 at this point. 64K of RAM. Um, it's an 8-bit system. It's clocked at 1 megahertz, but it takes eight clock cycles 
to fetch something from a register. And this sort of makes sense when you realize the processor is not a chip. The processor is a series of at least a dozen printed circuit boards that exist in the cabinet on the left. So a register is not like a couple of transistors in a silicon chip that's right next to the, pro to the arithmetic unit. It's like the registers are on this board and the arithmetic unit is on this board and there's a lot of cable in between the two. So you only get about 35,000 instructions per second. I think a Casio wristwatch would comfortably outrun that. We've got two, I think maybe three, five megabyte disk drives. These are the sort of the big things on the right hand side. And there is a teletype at the front. So that's where the operator sits down and gives it input and output. Cost about $130,000. This, I think you will agree, is a PC. It is the IBM PC, 1982. Clock speeds have gone up a bit. Obviously, the processor is much smaller, it's a much cheaper system. This cost you about $1,500, 64K of RAM again. Um, floppy drives were optional on the IBM PC. Does anyone know what an IBM PC would do if you bought the base spec without floppy drives? Does anyone know what it would do? It's 1982. It does what every computer in 1982 would do. It boots to a basic prompt. This thing is just a Commodore 64, except it's three times the price. That's really what's going on here. Um, but it turns out the floppy disks were kind of useful. And the, the operating system that was supplied with it turned out to be kind of popular for reasons that I find annoying. It also has somewhere to plug in a cassette deck. Right, so floppy drives are optional. You just plug in a tape drive. How many of you have loaded? Put your hands up if you've ever loaded software from a cassette tape. Have we got some hands going up? That's what a PC should be. Question, is this a computer? Well, it's got a processor and it's got some memory. I'd argue it's a bit light on the input output. I think it sort of depends what you plug into it. I would contend you can turn it into a computer but you probably have to make a circuit board like that to plug it into. It is, of course, so much faster than the IBM PC. 256K RAM, two megabytes of, of flash storage, two processors running at 133 megahertz, and they are 32-bit processors, not 16-bit. And the whole board costs $4. The main processor chip costs 75 cents. With the world we live in is wild in terms of access to computing power. Which led me to a question. If this is a computer, but it costs you $1,500, why isn't this a computer when it is more powerful? It has more capacity. Maybe we can make it a computer. So we've talked about applications. Uh, they run on a computer. What else does a DOS do? Well, it manages files on disk. And as we know, disks are called disks because they are round. You know, I guess it comes from the Greek. You think of a discus. They are round. Um, OK, these days, disks aren't disks, but they do a very good job of pretending to be disks. This is obviously an M.2 flash SSD. When you load from your disk drive, it's probably these days just memory chips. In ye olden days, 10 years ago, um, we had hard disk drives. They look like this. Inside, there are some round disks with a little mechanical arm moving over it. You know you're having a bad day when the little mechanical arm actually touches the disk. It's supposed to float above it on a very thin layer of air. It's never supposed to touch it. If it touches it, you'll hear it sort of repeatedly make the clinkety bonk, clinkety bonk, scratchy scratch noise. Then it's time to get the backups, folks, or pay a very expensive data recovery surface, um, company. OK, but there is something round inside. Um, and of course, these are cavernous in comparison to the floppy disk. Can anyone tell me how much data can be stored on that floppy disk? Ah, yes. Yes. <laughs> Skull, yeah, yeah, shout out for Acorn. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. This is my Acorn Risk PC. But can anyone, how, mu how much data is on that disk? I was really hoping someone was going to say 1.44 megabytes because you are wrong for two very excellent reasons. One, one, this is a 720K disk. And the second, I'm going to take this diversion. 
What happens if you double 720? What do you get? 1,440. And these are binary kilobytes, kibibytes. We are working in units of 1024 because fundamentally this is built out of 512 blocks. So there was this time in the 1980s where somebody went, 1,440 is a mouthful and I don't like that number, so I'm going to divide it by a 1,000 because I don't understand computers. They should have divided it by 1,024 because that's how memory and everything else system works. This is a 1.40 megabyte floppy drive. 1.44 makes no sense because you've used the binary kilobyte and then divided it by a thousand to produce some kind of Frankenstein creature. Also, this disk is actually from an Amiga, which is why it says Workbench 1.3. Um, but the Amiga was in a bad place for me to photograph, so I popped it in here. Why is this called a floppy disk? It's not very floppy. This one's slightly more floppy. Can we have a shout out for Commodore? This is my Commodore. 128D. Um, this disk drive holds, I think, about 170 kilobytes. Um, not a huge amount of storage, not desperately reliable. Um, but again, not that floppy. That's not a floppy disk. That's a floppy disk, to quote The Simpsons. So yeah, they started out being 8 inch, and they were sort of really wobbly in comparison to the hard or the fixed disk drives. So this is sort of the history of of storage, really. We have these um, big disk, eight inch disks, the micro floppy, um, sorry, the mini floppy is the one in the middle, and the micro floppy is the, is the one on the right. It was invented by Sony in the mid 80s. So a disk operating system has to deal with these various bits of magnetic media. And what are they? Well, we can divide each disk surface up into rings. So each ring we call a track, and then we can move some kind of arm across the disk and we can access the tracks. The tracks are not a spiral. They're a spiral on a CD-ROM, as it turns out. But on a floppy disk, they're not a spiral because that will be annoying to, to get back to a repeatable location. They're divided into tracks, and we can move this stepper motor to select a track. And then the mathematicians in the audience will tell me that section B is a sector. That is a sector of a circle. That is maths for you. The computer science people went, no, no, no. No, we only, we only care about the sector where it crosses the track. So actually, it's the little bit where the red ring meets the blue wedge. That's what you call a sector in computer science. And that is one small piece of the magnetic medium. And it can be read from start to finish as the disk spins around. The floppy drive has to do quite a lot of work because the sectors bump into other sectors. If the sector only contained your data, how would you tell where it finished and where another one started? And what if someone was really annoying and you used a magic word to mean this is the beginning of a sector, okay? That was supposed to be unique. And then someone used that magic word in the file they saved on disk. And the disk was spinning around and the computer read it and went, oh no, start of a sector. So you have, to find some, you have to find some combination of bits that is never used anywhere else. And they use various coding schemes to ensure that. So a, a disk operating system is responsible for managing this because really you want to think in terms of files. You would like these sort of ordered collections of bytes that have a start and an end and they have an order. If you had a file system that gave you bytes in your files, I've given you all of the bytes, I just haven't necessarily given you in the, in the right order, you would be pretty sad at your, at your operating system. And we need things like when the file was created, how large it is. So the disk operating system's job is to go from this kind of view it's an abstraction, if you like, from Kate's talk um, yesterday. We want to think in terms of files, but really the disk operating system is having to go back to this idea of, of tracks and sectors. And then as time has gone on, some of this work has gone into the hard drive. So really you just ask the hard drive for sector number 1,033,006, and the disk drive knows how to move the, move the heads and wait for the disk to spin around inside. And then... The, the, the flash drive we saw just sort of emulates the whole thing. So a disk operating system runs applications on a computer and it manages files on disk 
And I think the other key thing about an operating system is some kind of portability. And to discuss this, let's imagine a world where there are no operating systems. It's a simpler world, it's a more peaceful world, perhaps. So there is no operating system, so what we think of as an operating system just together with the application, we're just gonna, it's just one thing, okay? So you put the disk in the computer and you turn the computer on and it runs the software. It's great, simpler. I don't have any Windows updates to do. This is better, right? But except you're in the middle of using Microsoft Word, which you've just booted off the disk, but now you want to run Microsoft Excel. You've got the Word disk in and not the Excel disk. So how do you exit Word and run Excel instead? Well, now you sort of have to just, I guess, swap the disks, turn the computer off and on again. Some computers did work this way. Amstrad made a line of word processors that worked in pretty much this fashion. It gets annoying pretty quickly. What happens if I want to take my copy of Word on disk and run it on a different computer? Okay, well, I've, I've now baked into my copy of Word all the assumptions about the computer it's running on. I'm going to plug it into a different one. Does it have the same amount of memory? We said there are magical lockers in the locker room which are not really storage. They're not really RAM. There's some hardware devices connected. Does your computer have them all appearing at the same memory locations as my computer? As the author of Microsoft Word, I wouldn't want to have to deal with that kind of nonsense. So I think very quickly, when you imagine this world, you accept that, no, it kind of makes sense to split these concerns out. It's another good abstraction. Applications can live at the top. They exist on some kind of um, presentation of a machine. And then underneath, the operating system can deal with the nitty gritty, the dirty details of actually running your code on a computer. So that is briefly what, a, what an operating system or a disk operating system needs to do. Having got that out of the way, let's take a, uh, a quick run through the history of the operating system. So I think the first example I could find, uh, yeah, I appreciate it's not the best name, it is the Leo Master Program, um, was the first commercial computer. I think we can say Skull for Leo, they're not around anymore. Does anyone know where Leo came from or what Leo stands for? So you could, there's a, a museum in Cambridge, England, called the Centre for Computing History, and they've done a great research project on this, going back through the archives and talking to the people who made this machine. This is a computer from J. Lyons Tea Rooms. That is, a shop where you can buy tea and cake. Why does a shop that sells tea and cake in England require the invention of the world's first commercial computer? And the answer is because they sold a whole lot of tea and cake. When you have a thousand stores and the clerk in the store is calling up head office every day going, I need another 16 feet of Swiss roll and three pounds of tea and 17 gallons of milk. Someone has to add that all together, place the order with the dairy, send it to the factory. We need six miles of Swiss roll and I need to divide it up and send it out to all of my tea shops. And they realized that actually technology can help them. So they went to the University of Cambridge to that EDSAC machine you've built. I want one a bit like that, please. And we want to run, our, uh, we want to run some, some applications on it. It was made of 6,000 tubes, 1,200 relays, and it ran an application called Bakery Valuations. And that was its job, to sum up how much tea, how much cake had been sold, and make sure the shops got their correct orders. And then they realized, well, this is working for us. And other people would see that Jay Lyons had built a computer. Can I have one of those? So they went into business and they made computers and sold them. And I believe this is the first example of a computer that is sold for commercial business purposes. This is not academic research. This is a computer for doing a job. 1951. And then the operating system, the Leo Master Program, by the time you get to the Leo 3, it can run 12 different jobs at the same time. So here's an aside I found in Automatic Digital Computation, 1953. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you because it's a bit small. And I would try and do my best to impersonate uh, the 1950s newsreader style. I don't know if that makes, makes sense here. But an unusual feature which has been found valuable in fault finding is a loudspeaker connected to a waveform in the central circuits of the machine. 
This loudspeaker makes a noise depending on the sequence of orders being carried out, and every large program has its own characteristic rhythm. I love that. Every large program does indeed have its own characteristic rhythm. Should the machine stop or permanently go into a closed loop, the fact is instantly apparent. In testing the machine on a simple repetitive program, a single failure is easily detected as a break or click in the continuous tone. If nothing else out of this talk, I hope you will go away and think about plugging a speaker into the central circuits of your machine so that you can listen to the regular rhythm of your program. I love that. So let's move on into the 60s. The IBM System 360 operating system runs on that System 360 we saw earlier. Uh, 1964, uh, yes or no question, is the idea of software being late and rather bloated a new invention? No, IBM System 360 OS was late and rather bloated and it didn't really run on the hardware that IBM had already sold. Slightly awkward, so they shipped another bunch of operating systems in the meantime that were a bit smaller that actually fitted on the 32K machine they'd sold you. The operating system actually needed 128K. Awkward. Um, System 360 OS kind of lives on today. You can go to IBM and buy a mainframe. ZOS will, in some senses, System 360 OS compatible. There's a version of the OS that does one job. There's a version that does multiple jobs. There's a version where you don't even have to decide what applications you're going to run in advance. I know, novel. You can choose to run a different application when the computer's already turned on. This nonsense will never catch on. Um, and the idea of task switching was actually to wait to save time. A job could get stuck waiting for a disk. So we're like, fine, we'll just park that one and we'll go and run another one in the meantime. And task switching is actually there to make the system more efficient. It doesn't feel like it when you've got 3,000 Chrome tabs open, but there we are. Uh, Multix, another big operating system, late 60s, so 1969, written for the General Electric 645 mini computer slash mainframe. This machine cost a fortune. The operating system program was kind of a failure. And what do you do when you have a software program that is spiraling out of control and looks like it's going to be a failure? You stand up on a podium and declare it as a success. We have achieved every goal we set out to achieve with the Multix program, and therefore we don't need to continue it, which is what they did. This machine has 36-bit words, 18-bit addresses. Yeah, that C stuff, we go, a char's 8-bit. I heard that earlier. No, no, there are definitely machines in the world where that wasn't true, and there are still machines where that's not true. There's no distinction between files and RAM on a Multix machine. You say, I would like that file, and it says, excellent, it is available at these memory locations. There's no sense of read or write. There's just, file, please. Sure, it's in memory for you. When you access this memory address, I will fetch it. It's pretty impressive for 69. Dynamic linking, we have the idea of directories. There's a kernel. It's written in PLI. Um, in Multics, we don't hear about it today. But there was a little knockoff version, which you may have heard of. Um, it's a very small little project from a university in the, in the 60s. Um, I'm glad we don't really use too much of it today. Um, 1969 Bell Labs, Thompson, Ritchie, et al. Um, does anyone know what Unix was originally for? It's a big good quiz question. They had a Multics machine, and they had a game they'd written called Space Travel. And Space Travel cost $75 in CPU time every time they wanted to run it on the mainframe. This was annoying because they liked playing space travel. It's a solar system simulator, they'd written. Um, the acoustics department, fabulously well-funded. The computer science department, not so much. The acoustics department had a spare DEC PDP-7. It's pouring out for the Digital Equipment Corporation. They're definitely long gone. Um, it was a spare machine, so they thought, can we have it? Yeah. It's broken. Can we have some spare parts? Sure. Acoustic department don't care. They've got the money. So they basically steal this PDP-7 and they port space travel to it. They can play their game for free, happy days. And then they sort of worked on it a bit, and this, this operating system was written in assembler, but it had, they were Multics people, so they sort of did what Multics did. You had hierarchical file system, processes, device files, that all came along. Then someone wrote a little text processing utility in it called ROF. You still use ROF today. When you open a man page, man pages are still formatted in trough the updated version of ROF. Still there. Annoyingly, 
this hack together thing that someone only wrote so they could play their computer game for free turned out to be a bit useful. And other people went, it's quite nice. Can I have one of them? Um, and unfortunately, it spiraled out of control, and it's still here today, 50 years later. Uh, they invented a new programming language and rewrote their operating system in C in 1973. Uh, Unix family tree will blast through this because, as you can imagine, it's it's really small and really simple and just goes from one end to the other. So there is Bell Labs Research Unix. There are 10 versions of that. That's the original. AT&T sort of came out of Bell Labs. You get System 3 and System 5. Nobody knows what happened to System 4. That then span out into HP UX. We can't pour one out for HP. They're still with us. Just Silicon Graphics. Yeah, uh, they, ha they had their version called Irix. IBM's AIX still going. Sun, yeah, let's pay our respects to Sun. They had Solaris. They were all based out of System 3 and System 5. Then Berkeley did their own thing with the Berkeley software distribution, where they had the first version of Solaris, which was called SunOS. You had NetBSD, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, Dragonfly BSD, and then you had NextStep, which kind of went nowhere, except it didn't, because macOS is just NextStep. It's kind of the same thing. That's how Apple's got Steve Jobs back. They bought NextStep, they got Steve Jobs, and they just crossed out next step and wrote macOS. If you've done any macOS programming, the core object in Objective-C is an NS object. The NS stands for next step. Uh, Microsoft had Xenix. Microsoft were a Unix vendor. Um, I was going big guns for them. They weren't interested in DOS because Xenix was where they made all the money. And here is a picture of the family tree, and as you can agree, it's nice and simple. OK, let's crack on. Digital Research, yep, sadly departed. They wrote the control program for microcomputers. It ran on these sort of new 8-bit um, smaller computers. So mini computers were the size of a cupboard. A, a mainframe was the size of a room. Mini computer the size of a cupboard. A microcomputer you could put on your desk. Mid-70s. All of these companies, I think you can pull one out for pretty much all of those. Amstrad. Well, Alan Sugar's still on The Apprentice, but I'm, I think we can pull one out for Amstrad. I don't think they've made a computer recently. Um, CPM just needs a terminal plugged in, a floppy drive. It needs 16K of RAM. It only runs one program at once, and it's cleverly split into two pieces. There's a BIOS that deals with the very low bits of the hardware, and then there's the operating system, which is the same for every computer. So it's the idea of, sort of a portable operating system. So we've even divided our operating system into half so we can make the OS portable. Because the file system, knowing how big a file is, how many bytes it's got, what name it is, that's the same on computer A and computer B. So why do that work twice? There is no hierarchical file system. It doesn't support directories. You just put stuff on the disk. Um, and there's this uh, program called pip, which is the copy command. Why they didn't call it copy, nobody knows. Um, but if you copy a file to con, it knows you don't really want to create a file called con, you want to print it to the console. And if you copy a file to PRN, you don't really want to create a file called PRN, you want to send it to the printer. So this is where we get this idea of files that are magical. But they only exist in PIP. Uh, PC-DOS, MS-DOS. Um, I could spend at least <laughs> a day talking about the history of the PC. Um, it was a small project from IBM. They made big computers. They didn't really care about this machine. It was a side project, Skunks Works. It's kind of an accident that it took off. There was a to do with digital research who were going to supply the OS, and for various reasons they said no. So IBM went to Microsoft, who were supplying the BASIC, because this machine boots BASIC, so obviously it runs Microsoft BASIC. Um, and Microsoft went, yeah, sure, we can make you an operating system. That's no problem. And they went out and bought one. Um, the company they got it from didn't get a huge amount of money. Um, IBM then licensed it to IBM and retained the right to sell it to anyone else, which turned out to be genius because somebody else worked out how to make an IBM PC. Turns out you can buy all the same chips from the IBM catalog, from the, sorry, from the Intel catalog, and if you just put them on a board in the same order, you've got a PC, you just need to clone the BIOS, that, that uh, piece of software. Columbia Data Products were first, um, but they cheated and they copied the BIOS and IBM spotted them. Uh, people like Compaq did it better later without doing a copy, but it was compatible. And so we had the era of the PC compatible and CPM is now doomed. CPM was eventually available for the IBM PC, it just cost three times as much. DOS was the cheap option. Um, and now CON is a special file because we have directories, CON works 
everywhere, not just in the copy program, um, but anywhere on the system. Which is why today, in 2022, Windows 11 cannot create a file called PRN, because it will assume you are trying to send it to the printer because of decisions that were made in the 70s. It's wild. Try it for yourself. Even file extensions are ignored. You can't even make a file called aux.txt because aux is a reserved file name. I want to check. I haven't checked. I want to check. Does this even still apply on an ARM Windows machine? I mean, this machine is nothing to do with the PC at all, but these decisions from the 70s and 80s come back to haunt it. Uh, there's a link at the bottom. I'm not going to click it now because we're short on time. Meet me in the hallway track later, and I can show you the hardware, and I will play you the worst video ever made. Okay? Join me if you dare. So, what did Microsoft do? They had the Microsoft DOS, we had Xenix, OS2. You could spend days talking about what a mess that was. You had the 16-bit Windows line. Um, you had the 32-bit, 16-bit line, mid-90s. Anyone remember the Rolling Stones doing Start Me Up? All the adverts for Windows 95. Um, and then Windows New Technology, which is what we have today. Started with version 3.1 and is, is going on now. This is an example of Windows 1.0. It's, I think it's ahead of its time because it's a tiling window manager. Now, what it actually is, is an operating system that can't handle overlapping windows. So they have to tile because it literally can't draw one window in front of another. Somehow, this won the software war. I am baffled. Um, Windows NT sort of has a long story of its own. It's a multi-platform uh, operating system. It was designed to run on different processor architectures. MIPS was first. They wrote Windows NT for MIPS and then ported it to Intel to prove that it was portable. It's not really a PC operating system. It is, a, it is wider than that. Um, I think we can pull one out for Itanium. Oh boy, let's not go there. It is a very compatible operating system. It has plugins and sort of, um, not emulation layers, but um, sort of facades within it that allow it to appear to be lots of different operating systems. And it was designed by Dave Cutler, who came from doing uh, VMS at Digital, which led to a small lawsuit because it turns out the VMS manual and the Windows NT manual kind of look the same because the same person wrote both of them and they just went, well, that worked. I'll do that again. Microsoft paid $100 million to say sorry and ported NT to the deck alpha. Um, we haven't mentioned Apple, the big fruit company. The Apple One doesn't come with an operating system. It has 256 bytes of ROM. This is enough for a very basic terminal so you can peek and pipe uh, peek and poke bytes in memory. That's all it can do. Everything else you have to load. It gets uh, Apple Basic or Microsoft Basic. There's two versions, and there's Apple DOS, Pro DOS. The Lisa was the first Apple computer with a GUI. It was outrageously expensive. It cost $10,000 in 1983 dollars. However, it was very popular at NASA. Turns out they have big budgets. Who knew? They were very sad when the Lisa was canceled. Steve Jobs got kicked out of that project. He went to the Macintosh. That shipped in 1984, it cost a quarter of the price of a Lisa. The screen looks very similar, but underneath it's, it's not comparable. The, the Macintosh is a much more cut down system. It can't run multiple programs at once, but it's good enough. I know later they ported it to PowerPC. Early Mac OS system looks like this. Overlapping Windows, at least, you know, come on, you've got to give them that, but you can only run one thing at once. If you open Word for Macintosh, the Finder will disappear until you finished. Uh, Commodore. I, I could spend days talking about Commodore. Well, their 8-bit machines had BASIC. The DOS didn't run on the computer. It ran on the disk drive, which had its own processor and memory. Made the computer cheaper. Amiga OS is fabulous. And if you've never used an Amiga, do yourself a favor and go out and find an emulator and have a poke around with Amiga OS. When you think this system was launched in 1985. It is so far ahead of what everyone else was doing. There's a multitasking microkernel called Exec. Amiga DOS is the OS layer on top, which is actually a port of Tripos, which is the Cambridge University operating system written in BCPL, the predecessor to C. The GUI was called Intuition, and then they bundled some of this into a ROM they called Kickstart, and then it looked like this. This is Workbench 2. Um, but we have overlapping windows. We have multiple applications running at once. They did a demo of this system at the Lincoln Center um, when the Amiga was launched. And 
there was a, a ballerina dancing and there was an animation of a ballerina playing on a screen above above her, above the ballerina. And people just assumed it was a film. They had no comprehension that the Amiga was doing the animation in real time. On this system, the icon in the top right, if you click on that and drag it down, you can have a full screen application running behind the desktop. This was a classic Amiga demo. So you'd have this going, and people would, no, Amiga's quite good, isn't it? And then you just grab that, slide it down, and as you slide it down, slowly behind is revealed a full screen bouncing ball animation. It's going boing, 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 all done in real time. And then you can just slide the, sorry, didn't mean to do that, slide that back up. Incredible. People didn't really grasp what was going on. Atari, um, yeah, they're operating, they had an 8-bit operating system. It was basic. They had TOS, VOS, came from digital research. They didn't stop after CPM. They did the OS for the Atari. And again, that was split into BIOS and GEMDOS. And then you have the GEM desktop. Uh, I think this is an early one, and I think Apple sued them. I mean, it does look a bit like Macintosh system, if we're honest. I think there was a sort of a lawsuit-proof version where the windows weren't movable, which is one you, you might have seen. I don't know how you can patent movable windows. I don't know. Apple lawyers don't sue me. Uh, Acorn. Yep, dearly departed. I'm from England. Uh, Acorn's based in my hometown of Cambridge. They made a fabulous range of machines. You had the 8-bit ones, the BBC Micro that went into all the schools. Um, the operating system was called Moz, and it had a disk file system. BBC Basic is the best basic. I will not be taking questions on that. Go and check it out for yourself. It has an inline assembler. Come on, a basic with an inline assembler. That's pretty neat. Uh, they never had a 16-bit machine. They went straight to the 32-bit era with a processor of their own design. Apparently, a couple of them went round a chip company in America, and they went, where is everyone? And they went, no, this is it. We do the whole chip design with three people. in it. They do it with three people. We've got three people. We could make a chip. Mm -hmm. They did. Um, you've never heard of the chip that Acorn and their ad uh, advanced risk machines division produced. Uh, it became a spin-out, was part funded by Apple, and it became uh, ARM, which obviously no one has ever heard of and isn't you know, in everyone's mobile phone or indeed this Macintosh. Yeah, so the ARM chips we know and love came from Acorn and their initial experiments. With RiscOS, um, here is RiscOS. A quick aside, I want to pause on this one because I love it. It's a busy picture, but in the middle you see save as draw file. Somebody is saving a file from the draw application. How do they select which directory that file is going to be saved in? You know what happens on Windows or Mac OS, you get the directory chooser pop-up and you get to browse the file system. But doesn't your computer already have one of those? You have Windows Explorer or you have the Finder. So basically, Microsoft and Apple have given you two ways to pick a directory that are different. And Acorn went, well, this is nonsense. You don't need that. So to save that file, you go to the disk icon on the left, and then you browse through the folders, and then you drag and drop it to the folder you want. And that is how you choose where the file is saved. So again, I want to reinforce this idea that these, these preconceptions you might have about how a computer has to work are not true. A computer does not have to work like that. It is done like that by convention because people have muscle memory. Um, and the people who love RiscOS, they really get into it and they can't handle a Windows machine because it does things in its own unique way and they learn to use it and they love it. They find it very familiar, very comforting, good muscle memory, very efficient. There we go. Save a file in RiscOS. It's all drag and drop. You want to print it, you just drag it to the printer. Uh, Linux. Um, I'm not going to well actually you at this point, but it is a kernel and not an operating system. The tools were supplied by uh, the Free Software Foundation, the GNU project. stands for GNU is not Unix. They provided the compiler, the library, the shells. Um, but these days, really, I like to think of a Linux distribution as a pick and mix. You know those sweet counters where you're like, I'll have some cola bottles, I'll have some, some fizzy chews, I'll have some chocolate mice. That's what a Linux distribution is. I'll have the kernel, I'll have Wayland, I'm going to have Pipewire for my audio, I'm going to ship this browser. So somebody has to curate this collection and bring it all together. Key takeaway, Linux is not an operating system. It's a, Ubuntu is an operating system because it's had all these bits picked. So. What is an OS? A brief history of the OS. We've got about 15 minutes left by my clock. Let's talk about where OSs are today. 
Uh, Commodore, gone. CPM, gone. IBM, gone. Uh, sorry if there's any IBM people in the audience. You're still here with us, really, in spirit. Uh, Apple, early Apple system, Apple Carbon, gone. We are just left with Windows NT and POSIX, the Portable Operating System Interface X. Nobody knows what the X stands for. Uh, and maybe your web browser is an operating system. You can debate me in the bar afterwards whether you think that is true or false. Um, give you a clue. You can boot Windows 95 in your web browser. So, uh, well, yes, the, 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 the good distinction. So the, the point was, uh, is your web browser an operating system is distinct from the discussion of, is it a good idea that your web browser can be an operating system? That's a good point. So what does Windows NT look like? We have kernel and user space. The kernel API is private, and you may only talk to the kernel through the libraries you are given. If you are an antivirus vendor or doing some other naughty things and talking to the kernel directly, no, that is not allowed, and it will break. Um, we have executables and libraries we can load. The paths look like this, even though you know it's not the 70s anymore. The hard drive is called C, because obviously A and B are reserved for your two floppy disk drives that your Surface Book Pro um, obviously has. Uh, and the functions in the library look like this. They're in camel case, and they have a weird letter at the end, because Microsoft screwed up Unicode implementation, and the world still has two copies of every library function, one that takes ASCII and one that takes the wrong kind of Unicode. So well done, Microsoft. We can't get out of this. This is just the world. This is just the timeline we're in. Sorry. Uh, POSIX on Linux, kernel API is public. If you want to talk to the kernel, you just execute an instruction. The instruction is syscall. Uh, the processor does magic. You end up in kernel land, like on the other side of the magic barrier. Um, we have, yeah, executables. The libraries are called shared objects. The paths have the slashes this way round. You can get into a discussion about why Windows slashes are the wrong way. It's DOS2's fault because they already were using the slash for a command line option. So they went, well, we can't use that one, so we'll use the other one. From your point of view, that may be the other way around. Anyway, isn't it really annoying that a decision an engineer took on a whim in 1982 when they added directories to MS-DOS still bites you in the backside now? You put the wrong slashes in your include path. Some compilers like it, some don't. And the functions are very short because this is from the 70s and you could only have five characters in a function name. So we have open, read, write, and create because they couldn't afford the E. Uh, POSIX for Mac OS, very similar, except the kernel API is private. But really, you can, ignoring the display, all the things underneath. This is a, uh, Mac OS is a Unix. Linux is very Unix-like. They're both POSIX, um, so it's kind of portable. Windows is the outlier unfortunately the one that sells the most. Uh, so what can you do when you write an application? We file handling, yeah, we can start and stop programs. Some consoles, so we have those text windows which emulate the teletypes we saw earlier. We can print, we can scroll the screen. Form feed, rolls onto a new sheet of paper. Line feed, rolls the sheet of paper on. Carriage return, moves the print head, the carriage, back to the start of the sheet of paper. That's why you have carriage return and line feed. They're two separate operations. But argue I think Windows got that one right. Uh, obviously, APIs for graphics and things, networking, memory management. There's lots of stuff we expect an operating system to do. We're going to talk in a minute about whether my operating system is going to do these things. It's not. OK, a brief note on APIs and ABIs. Basically, the API is the source level interface. It have a function, it has these arguments, the function is called this. You can have an API that goes over multiple processor architectures. On an ARM or a PC, I both have a function called open that takes these arguments, so it's source level. The application binary interface is lower level. This speaks to when you call a function, you can't call a function on a processor, that's not a thing. It can move the instruction pointer and start executing code at a different address. So the place you are calling from, the caller, has to arrange some stuff in memory, registers or RAM. Uh, and then when you jump to the callee, the function you are jumping to, it has to look in the same place for the data the caller has just put. If they disagree, 
on whether the first argument goes in a register or goes on the stack, then you are going to have a bad day because A will put it on the register and B will pull it off the stack and it's not there and it's going to crash. So the ABI is the set of rules about registers or stacks, what order, where things go. Um, and this is where we get um, binary compatibility. As an aside, don't have time to talk about it, but you really should look up ARM64EC because it's fascinating. Because they took the ARM ABI and they threw it out of the window. This is Microsoft. Uh, they threw it out the window because it turns out to be really annoying when you're trying to run Intel code on an ARM Windows machine. And there's a lot of Intel code on an ARM Windows machine. So what they did is they changed the ARM ABI to sort of look like the Intel one. So the use of registers and the use of stack is very similar. And then it becomes much more cheap to bounce from ARM code to emulated Intel code and back again. It's a genius idea. Um, and let's talk briefly about language portability. So we have these operating systems APIs, but we know that on Windows, opening a file is create file A, and on POSIX, it's open. What does the operating, what does the programming language do? Well, it gives you a, some kind of standard library. Uh, you have the C++ standard library, you have Python, pretty extensive standard library. Go lets you do file system stuff. Rust has a good standard library for doing file system stuff. So we can write portable source code, which we can then compile for Windows or for Linux or for Mac OS. Not the same binary. They have to make different binaries for each thing. That is technically not true. There is an example on the internet where someone's done that. Oh, just don't go there. Um, generally, you target a specific platform, A, B, or C. And it's probably Windows, Linux for Intel, or Mac OS, except Apple invented the ARM Mac, so now you need to do two kinds of Mac. And the Raspberry Pi people are in the corner going, hello, ARM Linux is a thing, help. Um, so you have to target these different platforms. Um, and yeah, I mentioned SigWin, it lets you do POSIX-ish things on Windows, but the semantics don't really match. Fork isn't a thing on Windows, so yeah, it's sort of an option if you want to port some stuff. Okay, so there's a blast through. What is an operating system? What is a computer? Where are the operating systems today? So why did I decide to write a new one? What have I done? Well, I wanted to write just enough operating system. I wanted to make a computer, a very simple computer, and how much operating system do I need for that to happen? Because what I want is to be able to load an application. I want to walk up to the machine and say, load Snake, load Pac-Man, load Demo Tune, and have it do different things. So this is not an embedded system, because an embedded system does one thing. A computer, I would argue, is a machine where you can walk up to it and get it to do a thing the designer did not envisage. Now, that doesn't count rootkitting your HP printer because the Wi-Fi interface has got a bug in it. That's not what I mean. It doesn't make it a general purpose computer. The intention is someone can walk up to it and do a new thing with it. That's what makes a computer. And I wanted it to be understandable because I think all of the examples of operating systems we have so far are too big. They're too complicated. Point me at one person who understands the entirety of the Linux kernel. You can't because AMD just shipped a driver update where they added 1.7 million lines of auto-generated header file to describe their latest GPU. The, the scale of these things is just colossal. And I think, I think we demonstrated right up at the beginning, you can have an application that is much simpler. You agreed that Word 5 and Word 1 were applications, and they were running on a machine with very little RAM that could only run one task at once. There were no windows overlapping. You agreed that was an application. So I want to make that kind of computer again. But I don't just want to dust off the IBM PC. Um, I've got old computers. They break. They're 40 years old. You know, Electronic circuits don't last that long. They age. They fail. So I want a new computer made with new parts Turns out buying parts these days is a bit of a problem. There's a whole other talk we could get into. If you've not chatted to a hardware engineer friend recently, chat to them and say, how's that chip supply crisis going? Um, and then watch them sob. Um, it's going badly. Uh, I wanted to make a machine that was open source and open hardware. The schematics and the PCB design for this are on GitHub. 
the Gerber files, that is the diagram of how the PCB is made that the factory needs, is a job output from a GitHub action, because I believe hardware is no different to software. I do not check my exe into GitHub. I do not check my Gerbers into GitHub. They are built. The KiCad files live there that describe the PCB, and then I generate the PDF schematics, the Gerbers, the bill of materials. It is all generated automatically. So here we talked about why Windows, Mac, Linux is wrong. They're just too big. So what does Neotron OS have? We have a single flat address space like DOS, but without segments. Hooray. The OS API is public and is just provided in the form of a structure full of function pointers. So if you want to know what the API is, you just get given. I have given you API. Do you like it? There's an open, there's a close, there's whatever you need. It's all in there. I don't have to do syscalls or magic interrupts. It's just call the function and I will do the work. And I will wait until the work is done and then I will return. There's no background IO. There's no async stuff. It's just open a file. Some time passes, file is open. Super simple. We have executables. You can only load one of them at once. For reasons, Rust won't let me do relocatable code on this platform, so there is just space for one executable in memory. And you load one, and you run it. And when it's done, it exits. You can load a different one. Nice and simple. The paths look like this. I've chosen the Unix slashes because they are the correct slash. But starting with drive letter C doesn't make sense because I don't have floppy drives, so I've numbered my drives. So the drives will be zero. I am using SD card, so it's fat, so it's 8.3 file names. Um, and yeah, so you get a table with full of functions like this. This is a function pointer. Uh, open file is the field in the struct. It is a function. It takes a path. The path is a string slice um, that is designed to be UTF-8. This is a, although I have a $4 processor and you know no real hardware engineering skills, I'm not going to make Microsoft's Unicode mistakes. All of my APIs are UTF-8 as they should be. The mode is neither a string nor an integer, where sitting bit 7 means that uh, groups can write to this file, but only when it's a Thursday. Instead, the mode is an object, and the object will have methods on it for like, make it writable, make it readable, because this is the 21st century. We can have nice things, even though we're making an operating system for a $4 computer. The uh, return type of the function is a result. It either works, and you get a file handle, or you get an error. You cannot mix the two up. I'm not going to give you a signed integer where positive numbers mean it's a file handle and negative numbers mean it's an error. And what does zero mean? So why am I not just building an embedded system? Ah, oh, they're boring. It's a well-solved problem. There are plenty of people that can talk to you about embedded systems. And besides, I like old computers. So I wanted to make a computer, which is why it has the three color audio jacks, the video is blue, the keyboard is purple, the mouse is green. This is what a PC looked like in 1997. Why do I make it open? Because I want this to last. I have this you know, huge ego. I want this to be a thing that exists. And I want to teach people about computing. It's why I'm here. The thing I want you to take away from this talk is that computers do not have to be the way you see them now. They have existed for far longer than that. Um, and you can make a computer in different ways. And in the future, maybe you should consider making a computer different again. They were different in the past. They can be different in the future. Um, I'm, not, I'm not interested in money. We just give this thing away. Maybe it's useful. What do you get? A keyboard port, SD card, audio, uh, and a video display. We're going to set this up outside. It doesn't work on the projector. Well, will you be able to have a look and you can see the thing boot up? in text mode. It's not a very compelling demo at the moment. Turns out it's quite a lot of work to get VGA video out of a $4 microcontroller. So there we are. We've talked about make this the smallest possible operating system. So opening and closing files, going to have to have that. Uh, we have a screen and a keyboard, but we're not going to do networking, processes and threads, locks and RPC. I'm delighted to say that is not going to be a problem on this operating system. No memory protection. If you want to write over the kernel, yeah, feel free. It's your computer. If it crashes, press reset. Um, OK. And then, yeah, we can, we've talked about portability. Uh, why am I doing it in Rust? OK, 
because I just really like Rust. It's a nice community. It's a nice expressive language to prove it can be done. You know, we don't have to make a 1970s style computer in a 1970s style language. Um, there's a bunch of notes on the ABI and stuff, which we don't need to talk about. Uh, there's a nice 3D picture of the board. KiCad's got some pretty cool 3D features. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of reusable components on the board. Um, that's what it looks like when it's running. So that is everything. We don't have time for questions, but you can doorstop me outside and we can lament the passing of, uh, of Silicon Graphics. Thank you very much, everyone.